discover Auburn uh, Lecture Series. We came up with that name uh, based on the fact that we have invited Auburn faculty members to share information about their research projects, uh, hence the title Discover Auburn. Uh, Dr. Crocker uh, is the second speaker we've had, uh, or actually the third speaker we've had in this uh, series, and we're planning to continue it in the fall, so there'll be publicity about that in the fall. The libraries, the Center for Arts and Humanities, in the uh, College of Liberal Arts uh, and the Auburn University Bookstore are sponsoring the lecture. Speaking of the bookstore, copies of Dr. Crocker's book are available uh, at the reception, which will be in the room behind the reference desk uh, following the lectures. Uh, all of you, I'm sure, know Dr. Crocker, or maybe some of you don't, but in case there's some of you who don't, uh, she is professor of history at Auburn University, and she is the director of the Women's Studies program at Auburn University. So let's welcome Dr. Crocker. Well, thank you all very much. Let me recycle the joke. This is not a presidential forum for the dark horse candidate for university president. This is me, <laughs> known to most nearly all of you. And thank you so much for coming today on a wonderful day when it would be nice to be digging in the earth or something like that. But we'll dig in the archives instead a little bit. Um, how long, how many hours did you say this should take? Uh, no, no more than three hours. OK. Yeah. <laughs> well, I would like to really seriously thank, um, thank the people who worked to set this talk up and especially Dwayne Cox, our archivist, and Mark Wilson, who was an amazing publicist, and um, also um, Joyce Hicks here in the archives, and um, Margaret Hendricks, who's always wonderful, always comes through for me with books, and, um, and also Gary Hawkins, who taught me one, yet one more um, thing to do with um, PowerPoint, which I didn't know. So nearly know all of it now, but not quite. Okay. Um, this book's an example of a recovery project um, so-called, that is, historians of women's lives have set out to recover the lives and voices of silenced or neglected subjects. And so I just, before I start, I should say there was almost nothing written on SAGE at all. But when I started this, there was one very brief biography, um, biographical sketch of about, I suppose, 200 words in, um, in a reference book. And so this is really a kind of a, a recovery, um, an archaeological dig, if you like, um, through the archives. So I have some images. I'd like to go from my different images to tell you about the, um, the various challenges and the various leads that I took um, as I researched this. Um, I'd like to know if this mic is too loud. It's all right. OK, at the back. And so you have a handout, so I did list the um, archives that I used, so I'll be referring to some of these in here. Dwayne, you don't have one. Thank you. You've got to keep up with it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> There's a test. There is a test. <laughs> so I just let me, um, okay, I didn't number these pages. That was silly, wasn't it? But anyway, if you go on through here, you'll find something called Archives and Manuscript Collections. I'll be referring to many of these. I would... I hope I've got RDB on here. This is going to be very embarrassing. Let me see if it's on here. Oh, my goodness. Anyway, because the Auburn Library was always the first place that I, that I went for everything. <laughs> this, this was revised afterwards. This is just a draft, yes. <laughs> and, uh, and, um, but in looking for the life of this woman on whom really there was nothing um, much except a, really a trail of buildings that she established, um, I, I, w I went all over the place. As you see, I did go to 33 different libraries and archives, and so um, I've, I've um, listed them here, most of them. <clears throat> if you turn to the table of contents, which is the second page, I just want to talk very briefly about how I structured this life. Um, now, that sounds very pretentious, doesn't it, to structure somebody else's life? But um, <laughs> I'm interested in, in narrative, and um, biography, of course, is a kind of narrative. And um, <clears throat> when I started working on this um, project, I had an enormous amount of material for the last 10 years of the life and almost nothing for the previous um, 75 years. So I was really in deep trouble at that point. Um, <laughs> 
<coughs> so um, I divided it up into three, three parts. Um, this lady is dead, so we don't know how she would like, how she would represent her own life, um, whether she'd like this three parts. The first part I called a liminal place. I'm interested in the, um, so what some anthropologists have written about the limina, that is a person that moves back and forth across boundaries, as a person who myself has moved over boundaries in my professional and personal life um, from one country to another, from maybe even one discipline to another. Um, I'm interested in the, in the perspective that that gives you. Anyway, why do I call her liminal? I call it because, simply, uh, she was a governess in her adult uh, li life, for about 20 years, governess and a um, school teacher in the 19th century. So think of this Jane Eyre figure, this impoverished uh, woman who, and what is the governess? The governess is the kind of classic liminal figure. She's both um, a house guest, she's kind of a house guest and she's kind of a paid employee. And she goes back and forth. Now this is not original to me, this is Mary Poovey uh, writing on governesses. You may know her, she writes on 19th century culture. But anyway, I did think that was a very interesting way to think about Sage um, in this early period of her life. <clears throat> so as you see, she doesn't get married till, 1960, um, till 1869. At that time she's 41, so there was a whole chunk of the life that was uh, as a single person. Um, and I got the different um, chapter titles here. I've got, of course, the family background in number one. And then secondly, I look at education. Um, and it's Troy Female Seminary. I'll show you some images of that in a minute. Uh, the third one, I do enjoy my independence, was a lovely quote that I found in family letters. She's writing to her father. She's got a wage as a teacher. And she's uh, writing about that sense of independence, of being away uh, from the family. We tend to think of Victorian women as, as very kind of placed in the home and kind of locked away and everything. But we have to remember a great many of them were wage earners, um, even middle class women uh, were wage earners. They were away from home, and they were enjoying perhaps their independence. The fourth one is a sheer takeoff of a movie title, so we don't need to worry about that. <laughs> and then the second part, I saw a becoming. Uh, when she married, I trace a becoming. And this is really f um, five, one, two, three, four, five chapters that are actually, um, what's the word? They're all happening at the same time, contemporaneously happening, pretty much. And they're different activities that she engages in as a married woman, as a matron matronly woman, Victorian woman married to a very wealthy man. And so I'll talk about these. And they're all to do with the voluntary sphere. So my, my, I had an, a nice kind of boost in the 1990s writing about this topic because of all the attention that was paid to what is called civil society. There's been a great deal of interest in civil society and in that uh, non-state sector. So I found uh, you know, that was a way in which my work linked up with the non-state sector because I looked at these 19th century women's organizations as part of state building but not, whoops, within the state, I'm sorry. <clears throat> and um, okay, and then so briefly, obviously, these five are, not chapter five, which is, of course, um, her work in what was called Indian reform, um, which it was basically making Indians into Americans, as you can see, there's some paradox in that, um, bringing them off Western reservations to um, boarding schools, like the Carlisle School in Pennsylvania, where it was one of the places I did travel to, and trying to make them um, both um, dress, think, and um, of course worship um, as um, white Americans. The sixth, the chapter six was about her work at a hospital and I've had the pleasure of talking about this chapter before in this room and um, it's a New York Women's Hospital. It was a hospital founded and run um, by women but it showcased the work of a famous or notorious surgeon of the 19th century, J. Marion Sims whose statue is in Montgomery, I think, by the, um, whatever that is, the state house. Okay, number seven <clears throat> was about another voluntary association with, that Sage was very involved in. She was vice president and um, she was kind of behind it and it was the Emma Willard Association. So this 
uh, I think that um, perhaps traditionally as a historian you think, oh, it's nothing, you know, you just ignore this and go on and look for something more substantial. But I found an amazing language that these women were producing around these organizations, an amazing language of nationalism and class position, positionality. Uh, and I talk about that. Some aggressive work. And I love the, <laughs> I love the way they use that. That's her, um, that's a quote from one of the um, annual reports that I used in the New York Public Library. Mrs. Sage will lead us to some aggressive work. Um, well, it wasn't very aggressive, but anyway. Uh, number eight is about parlor suffrage. I have some pictures of that. And number nine is really what happens to gender, um, what happens to these elite women during the uh, war with uh, Spain over Cuba and so on, um, 1897 to 19, well, it goes on to 1906. It's about the, the construction of American nationalism. Um, and there I was very dependent on a new literature, very good new literature that's come out from people like Kristen Hoganson on American women's um, self-fashioning and nationalism in that period, because it's a racial fashioning too. Um, and then the last section, I, I didn't have to think about the um, title for this because I, she gave me a wonderful title. Uh, Olivia Sage was overheard to say, I'm nearly 80 years old and I'm just beginning to live. So I just took that as the section. Now, if somebody at the age of 78 says they're just beginning to live, this makes you pause and think, well, that is really disturbing. <laughs> you know, that's pretty bad. And what has made her so unhappy up to this point? Why is she feeling so, so cramped? And what is making her happy now? Well, power over the money. So she, this is when she inherits all this money. <laughs> 75 million, which I multiply by 15 to get current dollars. If anybody has a better, a more up-to-date number, I'd like to know it. So it's 75 times 15. It's a lot. And so she gets all of that. And she has what I see in number 10, a kind of old age freedom. And that is, I talk about that. In number 11 talks about founding the, the foundation. This was a very important and still ongoing social science foundation. It's actually celebrating its 100th, year, 100th anniversary this year in New York City. And it, it's, um, it supports social science, immigration studies, demography, um, that kind of thing. Number 12 is about her um, giving to colleges. <clears throat> and, and universities, <clears throat> which was an enormous part of her philanthropy. And then number 13 shows a change of direction. I put this in, the editor said, it's long enough, don't put this in, but I did, I'm afraid. Uh, nothing more for men's colleges. And I uh, talk about how at the age of 88, she founded a college for women in Troy, which is still there, it's called the Sage College, Sage Colleges. <clears throat> And then in number 14, I talk about all of the philanthropy, um, splendid donation. And that is from, the, from a letter, I think it was from Wellesley, uh, President of Wellesley to her writing, let us have a splendid donation from you. And I thought it was a really nice uh, phrase too. So, and then chapter 15, we get a sad ending to this book because unfortunately when we do history, you know our subjects do get old and die and that's very tough to live through for us historians. And so she gets to the point where she's just letting Miss Todd, that's her secretary, decide um, who gets the money. So send what Miss Todd thinks best, which was a note written on one of the um, envelopes. So with that, and clearly I'm going to be talking about an American philanthropist, and I should have said that to begin with. Let me see if I can work this thing. OK, so <clears throat> talking about um, the archives, I went first to the Russell Sa uh, sorry, the um, Rockefeller Archive Center, which is at Tarrytown, New York. It's about 45 minutes north of New York City. It has all of the papers. It has a huge collection of the Rockefeller papers, but it also has some sage papers. So that's what I um, started with. And there are about 5,000 letters there. And I went up thinking, well, this will be it. I can use this. It's going to be the basis of my biography. Um, I'm going to be able to come back to this lovely place a lot and read these letters. And of course, when I got there, I found my um, shock and chagrin. Um, many, most of the letters were to her, not from her. And so that presents not exactly an adventure, but it's certainly a challenge to a researcher to see uh, if you can tell somebody's life by what correspondence, what people write to them. What illusions are they making? Who, who are they mentioning? 
what kinds of favorite causes or places or familiar or loved places or people are they mentioning? What's the language of it? And so it was really almost a kind of, um, you know, a lot of guesswork and some imaginative work to use these letters. So here's an example. This is from 1915. She's nearly 80. Um, she's 87, I think, at that time. <clears throat> And um, I'll talk about this a bit later. But you can see it's pretty good writing for somebody of 87. It doesn't suggest somebody who has any kind of um, muscular you know, tremor or anything like that. Maybe that's that prejudice for me to say that. So um, here's a picture from the Outlook, which I used in this wonderful library, a contemporary periodical. And it's a, an article in, called Five Great Gifts. And it has five great philanthropists. So uh, this doesn't um, show anywhere. I'll read it to you. So she inherits 75 million and um, received about 300 letters a day. I don't know if I can go down here. I'm not even going to try. Yes, I am. Um, no, I don't seem to have any control over that. So, A friend who, um, a friend who visited her wrote to another friend. Um, she was absolutely drowning in letters. So she had a, a terrible problem how to deal with this correspondence. People write to wealthy people. I didn't know this, but you know, if you hear of somebody winning the lottery, apparently thousands of people just simply write. And how they construct themselves is really interesting. The way that they say why they explain, it's almost like filling out a form for a, an entitlement or something. How they explain why they're actually entitled to some of this person's money is interesting. Thank you. Absolutely drowning. So, what is so? Well, these were some of the big questions that I was dealing with in this um, book. What is benevolence? What is altruism? And how do people make make claims on a complete stranger? It's fascinating to me that people can make claims on a complete stranger, and sometimes it's successful. It makes you feel like trying. <laughs> okay. Well, this this letter that you this pink one. See who it's to, Lillian. Dear Lillian, a lot of these letters were to Lillian. Or they were signed by Lillian. So I asked the archivists, who are very, uh, very high-powered archivists at the Rockefeller Archive Center, and who Lillian was, and they didn't have a clue. <laughs> Not a clue. I said, but hundreds of her letters are signed by Lillian. E. Lillian Todd, who is she? No, we don't know. So anyway, here, uh, here she is. So this was a wonderful kind of lucky, lucky kind of scoop thing. Um, <clears throat> You know um, that um, Rockefellers, the two Rockefellers, didn't, of course, deal with their own correspondence. They had an entire staff of people dealing with their paperwork. Um, John D. Rockefeller had um, Frederick Gates, of course, well-known uh, figure, and Sage had E. Lillian Todd. Now, this, that's not remarkable, but E. Lillian Todd turned out to be a very interesting person. She turned out to be an inventor. Uh, she turned out to be a, a single woman of about 40, 40 to 50. Um, she, had been, um, <clears throat> she, she hadn't been to college because it was before. She went to a kind of vocational uh, training and did uh, bookkeeping and patent law. And she ended up working in a patent office in Washington in the 1860s and 70s. So she learned some, some I think, about law. She um, gained some skills. And she was a tremendous, we'd call her today an engineer. Today, she'd be doing a, a PhD in engineering, but that wasn't possible at that time. So um, there was some, and then I had a um, correspondence with an aviation historian uh, from California, out of the blue, who wrote to me, um, do you know this E. Lillian Todd? I thought, yes. Um, they said, she invented a plane. She built a plane. Did you know? I said, no, I didn't know. So that started me off into some aviation history. Of course, my colleagues, um, Jim Hansen particularly, and Bill here, uh, helped me with that. And so we found that she did indeed design. And uh, this plane, it was wood, partly wooden. I think many of them were at that time a biplane. She never actually took it up, but it was flown. And the important connection with Sage is that Sage sponsored her. She was her patron. And so this is you know, an interesting thing to look for, is how successful people are sponsored, or how they are funded by other people. And so Olivia Sage, who was already much older than this, um, she recognized the talent of this woman, this middle-aged spinster. And she gave her, nine, I think it was $9,000 to develop this plane. And so there she is, a lovely picture. I love this picture. <clears throat> and there she is again, not quite such a good image. This was out of a newspaper. A lot of my research was just in the newspapers. It's remarkable what you can find in newspapers. 
um, those that are indexed and those that are collected in various ways. For example, the suffrage uh, stuff that I have, it was all in a big scrapbook. Um, people spend whole lifetimes going through papers and clipping things out and sticking them in scrapbooks. So as historians, it's just a matter of finding the scrapbooks. And so in New York, there's wonderful scrapbooks on suffrage, New York Public Library. So there she is in her. Okay, so here is Olivia Sage in her mature years. Uh, and um, as I said, I am interested in altruism. And I was interested in the concept of giving as generosity, which on the other hand doesn't diminish what you already have. Um, didn't impoverish her, even though she gave, I think it was about a third of a billion dollars altogether in present day money. Um, one thing she did when her husband died is she bought four, 12 fur coats. So here she is enjoying one of them. Now New York's very cold in the winter. And there she is enjoying one of them. And here is her signature at the bottom. Margaret Olivia Sage, which she never used, Mar hardly ever used Margaret. <clears throat> if you're interested in pursuing these issues of um, altruism and gifting, there is an interesting literature um, coming out on that, or coming, you know, already out there, really. A person who was very important in her philanthropy was Robert de Forest, an advisor. She inherited them, really, from her husband. Her husband dies in 1906 at the age of 90. And she's 78, so she has a little bit of leeway there. And so she inherits this, this quite aristocratic and wealthy man, a uh, philanthropist in his own right. Um, one thing he did was he, he um, denoted a very large amount of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It was one, I think at least a whole wing is a DeForest wing. They had a um, law firm, the DeForest Brothers, and his correspondence with Olivia is very important for looking into the philanthropy, um, for seeing how it's how it is, um, how, how the decisions were made. <clears throat> we already knew that he pretty much designed the foundation. That's the Russell Sage Foundation. She set that up with $10 million in 1907, April 1907. And it was a very modern thing in its time. It was a general purpose foundation, the general purpose foundation. That means it, the money was to be used for the improvement, quote, improvement of, of social and living conditions in the United States. So very broad, very um, altruistic, I guess, and very progressive in both senses of the word purpose for this. De Forest was a progressive. He's a housing reformer. We talked about him in class. Well, in class today, we were doing housing reform, weren't we? He's one of those that went to the you know, tenement house thing. Okay. Another interesting person that came into my research was Helen Gould. Now, you may have heard of A. Gould, a famous Gould in the 19th century. Who would that be? Hmm? Jay Gould, that's right. Well, this is his daughter. Now, when you see Jay Gould was one of the most n notorious or robber barons, or if you're a business historian, he was a most far-sighted um, <laughs> builder of industrial capitalism. Uh, a very um, amazing, the successful and consolidator of national markets, railroads, banking and finance, and so on and so forth. And his daughter, though, uh, this is Helen Gould, <coughs> about eight, he had four children. And um, Jay Gould, by the 1890s, he, uh, well, he died of tuberculosis in 1894. And Helen, um, they lived next door to the Sages in New York City in the 1870s. And so Olivia Sage was actually the Sunday school teacher for Helen Gould and the other Gould children. And uh, so here she is. She was an extraordinary philanthropist, and she didn't have the break on her that um, Olivia had. They had a kind of mother-daughter relationship that was a very um, religiously express, expressed in terms of evangelical religion. So as you see here, quote, Helen was, quote, her spiritual daughter who gives here and there at her direction and advice. So it's really interesting. You get these two setting off together, one a person of, say, uh, in her 60s and the other one perhaps 35, Helen, very timid, very um, attractive but, but shy. Um, and Helen has all the money to give away, and Sage is kind of advising her, well, let's build a big YMCA here, let's build a YMCA there, and they build these enormous YMCAs uh, all over the country, and in other countries like um, the Philippines and so on. And one can still see, if you go to a big city, those amazing Gilded Age Ys and other institutions too, Siemens homes. They were very keen on Siemens homes for reasons that we could talk about another time. 
Okay, here's, um, so, well, I went then back, <clears throat> of course, to try to find about this missing 40 years of the early years of Olivia's life. <coughs> she was Olivia Slocum. She was born in Syracuse of a family, the uh, very marginal, very typical 19th century, um, just on the edge of ruin all the time and just on the edge of prosperity. Very much bobbing on the waves of, of an unregulated um, capitalism. The father, for example, I found um, <clears throat> a scrap of paper actually um, at the Onondaga Historical Society where, um, well one was, well, this one was um, that the Slocum family retained, they retained a house and a stable, but with only room for one horse, <laughs> and they'd sold the rest of it. So this was after the 1837 panic, when her father was, um, was pretty much ruined. And I found the sheriff's sale of all the land, about two, 300 acres that he had to sell at that time because he was um, bankrupt. Then he recovers, then he's bankrupt, and he just goes up and down. Okay, so she had to, had to earn her living. And um, there is a book about the sages. There is one book. It's by Paul Sarnoff. <clears throat> it's very hostile. Paul Sarnoff has written books such as How to Get Rich in the Years Ahead and things like that. He is actually a money person. Um, and he didn't know much about I mean, he did a good job on the money history, but not on the personal history. He described her as, in such words as, quote, the severe case of acne which had plagued her earlier had now cleared up and things like that. I'm not sure if this is a bad photograph or if this shows, in fact, that Paul Sarnoff was absolutely accurate about her skin condition. Well, there we are. The proactive view. Um, never mind. Okay. <clears throat> so <laughs> I found a much better photograph when I went... Um, <clears throat> When I went to, um, I found some family members, and there again, this library was where I found, where I struck gold, and the gold was the obituary index for the New York Times. So, um, some of you know, I have told you already this. Looked up the family, looked at when the last one died, and found that <clears throat> one of the descendants of this family died in the 1950s leaving a collection of valuable books to Scripps College. So I thought, well, that's interesting. I went home, I phoned the librarian at Scripps in California, and she said, oh, yeah, um, yes, well, we have, um, we have a Mrs. Slocum um, in Pasadena. She lives in Pasadena. She's a grand dame, she said, and her phone number is. So I phoned up this person, and she was wonderful. She said, yes, um, you know, very interested, and come and visit. And then, and then she said, we talked quite a bit. She said, I don't want to be go on talking on your dime, she said. Though these people are millionaires, multi-millionaires, so I thought it was very funny. But anyway, I did go to her house and I found wonderful, um, some much better pictures, photographs like this one was at her house. I also found there the missing correspondence for the two decades, um, the 18, well really from the mid-1830s up to the marriage in 69. Um, and that was great and they let, she let me stay and I took notes on those letters like, like anything. <clears throat> Here's um, Joseph Slocum, Elizabeth's father. Um, this is, to me, interesting. I mean, I, it's a long time since I got to think about American industrial history, but he, um, you know, he's very much a product of this period of, and it's upstate New York, so this is boom and bust uh, time, 1840s, 50s, and 60s. Um, stalked by bankruptcy and tuberculosis. He was an inventive person. He invented a new kind of thresher, all kinds of new agricultural machinery, but he couldn't make a commercial success of anything. Um, he went to Russia to try to demonstrate his machinery. He went there two or three times. I have letters um, from that. And he had all kinds of funny schemes, like he took ice from Norway and tried shipping it to uh, north of England, and that wasn't any good. I think it melted or something. He took wheat from through New Orleans and took it to Antigua, and it was ruined. So it's all of his schemes that he writes about. He writes these very complaining letters about his um, business failures. <coughs> For Olivia, he wasn't a great example of a strong, successful um, father, really. He was more of a dependent person. And her mother was a wronged woman, a woman whose ancestors really had quite some good connections. I mean, an early member of her, Pearson, was actually a, um, I think, let's see, the head of the um, let's see, New England, let's see, Massachusetts school system. Another one was a, a Yale um, chancellor or something like that. And, so there were some connections. She was fairly ambitious and um, snobby, actually. 
So she wasn't at all happy that her husband couldn't make um, a, a decent living, and actually the house was sold. And so she actually has to leave and go and live with relatives. She actually lost her home. So it's a typical kind of shipwreck, as we talk. There's a good essay, isn't there, on 19th century economy called Shipwrecked. And I think these, this family was um, shipwrecked. <clears throat> OK, well, I didn't stop there. Um, <laughs> I did go, of course, to the school where Olivia had gone in 1846-7, and that was the Troy Female Seminary. <clears throat> um, Troy Female Seminary, which sounds very much as if it has to do with embroidery and behaving yourself, but actually has a quite impressive um, curriculum. And John Lord, who wrote a, a classic book on women's education, wrote, in all essential respects, it was a college. Well, um, one thing they did was they borrowed the physics teacher from the Rensselaer Polytechnic, who was just up the road, uh, Amos Eaton, and he came and taught science to these young women. They also had very progressive uh, kind of, we would call, sex education. Uh, this is the 1850s. They had a, the, the pictures in their textbooks apparently were so graphic that on Parents' Day, uh, large pieces of white paper were posted over these images so as not to upset the mothers who were visiting. So here's the... Uh, this is the year 1947, um, 1847 that she was a pupil there. And here is the, um, the queen, the queen of the Emma Willard, um, of the Troy Female Seminary. Of course, today it's the Emma Willard School, still um, a well-regarded private school, in uh, boarding school in Troy. <clears throat> I compare Emma Willard to Margaret Thatcher, or one of those people, powerfully feminine, an institution builder. Um, everybody described her as tremendously attractive, tremendously compelling, and she really was. I mean, when General de Lafayette uh, was traveling through the United States, he came to visit her, and there's this description of her. The girls had made a kind of bower for her, a kind of throne, and he, had, and he traveled up to it. He walked up to it, as you would up to meet royalty. Um, he trekked to Troy to meet her. She was very well known. Performance, public activity, and moral authority, uh, I think, characterizes her. And then, whoops, and here again, I was um, helped by the folks um, over in English, not, I mean, Mary Poovey again, who writes about Victorian culture and so on. Um, like Florence Nightingale, um, Emma Willard kind of lingers after she dies in the sense that people um, use her as an iconic uh, person. So like Nightingale, she would be displaced by her own image. I mean, um, everything that Olivia later wanted to do, she almost everything she said, as Emma Willard would have done, or um, as Emma Willard said, she used Willard to cover what she was doing, really, to authorize and legitimate it. She died actually in 1870, that one. So here are a couple of teachers. I don't want to run too late here. Um, you look, when you're doing biography, you see who mentored this person, who, was, who were the friends, and who, who helped her. Here are a couple of the teachers who were at the Emma Willard School, Troy Freeman Seminary. And they were actually became quite active reformers later. Here's Mary Bonney, a Quaker, Indian rights activist, as it was then understood. And um, I forgot to write this woman's name. This is Harriet DeLay, also a teacher. She said to Olivia, found a women's college in New York, and it will be like Mr. Rockefeller's college in Chicago, which of course was the University of Chicago, 1892. Uh, but she didn't. All right, so here is where the money came from. Here's Russell Sage um, <clears throat> from a quite in, a s insignificant family background. There were sages all over Connecticut, apparently. They trekked west, as so many other um, tens of thousands of people did, trekking west, uh, and ended up in upstate New York in Syracuse. Um, and then <clears throat> it's a great American success story. Uh, he. Um, you know, he just makes the right moves at the right time. He makes lots and lots of money, <clears throat> um, goes into politics. He is in Congress twice. And by the time, I don't say much about Russell Sage today, I'm afraid, but um, I just have to um, see. A bashful millionaire. By the time he's in his 80s, which is kind of when I'm concentrating on more today, and he's already, uh, he's been Jay Gould's partner, financial partner. He's kind of the silent one. Everybody knows Jay Gould. They know what he looks like. Um, they know what he's doing. And they know that Sage is providing the money for him, that there's this partnership between them. So um, Sage also uh, pioneered kind of commodities trading, futures trading. 
Uh, and this was before the stock market or that was kind of regulated in any way. So this was um, highly speculative, uh, but at that time legal. <clears throat> Okay, what one newspaper, the newspapers liked making fun of Sage because he was very miserly. One of them described him as a bashful millionaire. All his charities are done so quietly that not a soul hears of it. And of course, that was because he never gave anything to charity, apparently. Um, I can read that whole quote. It's a nice quote. Uh, there's another one of him, and uh, it's really fictional. It's him and a colleague looking out of their office at the graveyard of Trinity Church. And, uh, and complaining about how much gravestones cost. <coughs> um, now, if his charities were done in secret, his paternity suits were splashed across the paper. And here again, uh, at Auburn, at our library, I read the New York Times <coughs> in the 1890s, and I read about the various paternity suits. Um, Sage was a, a vigorous uh, 70, 80-year-old. <coughs> mm. Going back a bit, um, his first wife, um, as, he, as I said, he was an up-and-coming, uh, very ambitious, and so if you're ambitious, who do you marry? You marry the daughter of the mayor of Troy, which is what he did, and that was Marie Wynne Sage. She died, though, in 1867. I'm a terrible photographer, so here's the bottom half of her graveyard. <laughs> um, and I was <clears throat> one of the snowy sites that I went to. Um, dies in 1867, and Sage moves into, the, into, the, into a hotel to live a bachelor life again. And, uh, and it's somewhere along there in that next two years that he makes the acquaintance again of Olivia, who's 12 years his junior, and they decide to marry, and we don't know really why they married. So here is Wall Street in the post, post-war years, where Sage became very well known, where he made enormous amounts of money in this period. The panic of the 18, I think it was 1884, I don't have time to look this up, Two, I think I remember. Um, he apparently paid out eight million dollars out of his own uh, funds to creditors during this panic. <clears throat> this is a nice picture of the panic. The newspaper again, at 78, a notable instance of well-preserved energy. And um, they always remark on how spry he is, how economical he eats, and you know, an apple for lunch, and so on. And, all of the other Gilded Age, um, you know, robber barons are off enjoying themselves, and he is living a very, rather simple, conventional life. So here I've got some of the, <clears throat> so this is, would be a more typical house of a robber baron. Um, this is a Newport, this is just a summer cottage, of course. And I, at the last minute, I thought it was the Vanderbilts, and I was checking, and it's not. So if anybody can tell me what this is, I don't remember what this one is, but it is a Newport mansion. And here's the um, inside of it. So this is how the other, some of the other Gilded Age industrialists were spending their money. Not so the Sages. Here is the summer home of Ru Russell and Olivia Sage. And if you have flown into, say, JFK, it's the south side of, it's near there. It's the south side of Long Island. Okay. <clears throat> Lawrence, Long Island. And this is where they spent the summer. And why did Sage want to live there rather than Newport? Because he could go in on the train every day uh, to Wall Street. And so the story goes. So he's able to get into his office every day. Today we would call him a workaholic. Um, so this was, and there's a very wistful description of Olivia. She loved these balconies. This is right today. It's not so near the sea. Uh, it's near these marshes. The sea has receded a bit. Uh, but then it was by the ocean. And um, she loved to stand on the balconies and, uh, and look at the shipping with um, field glasses. And she could see all the shipping coming in and out of New York Harbor. And it's kind of a wistful description, because this is a woman who actually never goes out of the country, which is amazing when you think how even upper middle class and middle class people went to Europe, um, Americans, at this time. And they, she never travels. She goes to California once, Chicago once or twice, and that's it. So here she is, kind of looking across the ocean. <laughs> and this was her position. I'm interested in the position of benevolence, of, of charity, and of um, philanthropy. It's a positionality where you are in a certain relationship to other people. She's socially prominent as the wife of one of America's richest men. And um, I, was, I just like this. I just threw this into. <laughs> um, 
I liked the, the dichotomy between the fact that Sage was making the money and then after he died, she spent as much of it as she could. But while he was still alive, of course, she is giving in other ways. She's giving through voluntary work. She's working in these various voluntary associations. It is a kind of giving. It's a way in which Victorian women of a certain class could construct an identity, the benevolent identity. Some of you know this is Laurie Ginsburg's work, right, Melanie? Yes, okay. So this was an interesting photograph that I found as I started to explore the New York Women's Hospital. That archive is amazing. It's at the top floor of St. Luke's Roosevelt, which is a hospital right up near Columbia in New York City. And on the, on the top floor they have or had the archive of this hospital of the 19th century. And so um, this picture came up, this photograph. And um, you know, I don't know, there's been a meeting. Obviously there's a committee meeting, whether she's waiting for it to start or whether it's just over. Uh, what her role in it was, we don't know. We do see the bust at the back, bust at the back top there. I think that's J. Marion Sims. I think that's the surgeon. And um, it's a pretty lonely um, picture, even allowing for the fact that 19th century people didn't smile or laugh a lot in photographs. But it, it's a fairly, she looks fairly like a kind of specimen under glass or something, I think. Okay, then I went on into looking at suffrage. I thought, what is her connection to with another big voluntary social movement at this time, the suffrage movement? So um, I found a wonderful scrapbook in the New York Public Library. Um, as, as I said, somebody had clipped, you know, for 20 years, this woman had clipped out all these things about suffrage and stuck them in this book, and now it's on microfilm. So it's very much easier than going through the newspaper yourself. So here are some, just some interesting and funny cartoons showing um, what would be da the danger of women getting the vote. And you see they're going to become uh, lady orators. OK, can't have that. Playing cards. And then the next one is um, becoming lady policemen. I don't have a laser, do I? Um, and doing other various things that are very inappropriate for women of 1900 to do. Um, and the best one, of course, is this one which shows what would happen to men if women get the vote. <laughs> which is really nice. So you have a, uh, a boss and a typist. You have, you know, everything. A fireman, firewoman, and a person being rescued. And this just shows, you know, what was going on with the vote. The, today we think of the vote as, as pretty tame, something we should, of course, do, but not dangerous socially. But um, at that time it was considered a fairly radical demand because it symbolizes equality, of course. Well, this was another time that I um, was really happy, and I apologize to those of you who've seen this before. Some of you have. I went, um, can, you rant, can you put that down a bit for me, please? In this scrapbook, this wonderful scrapbook on microfilm, I think it was day three of me going through looking for anything that would be for this project. And then I came across uh, this, and it says, a woman's suffrage meeting in Mrs. Russell Sage's drawing room. So I was like, yay. Uh, very happy about that. I don't know which of these figures is or could be or any of them are her. Um, I did read the account in the New York Herald Tribune for that particular day of that meeting. And fortunately, they have the ha whole speech in there of these people. One of the people was Harriet Stanton Black, of course, Elizabeth Cady Stanton's daughter. Um, and so we have their speeches. And this is one of the things that Olivia said she, like many women of that time, she used the most conservative sources to, as an emancipatory text. I have been looking this subject of women's rights up in my Bible recently, she declared, and then she goes on a lot about the um, precedence for women's power in the Old Testament. Okay, another kind of voluntary work was the Emma Willard Association. And I know at the back, I'm sure you can't really see this, but there's a seated statue here. And that's a seated statue of Emma Willard. If anybody knows Troy, does anybody know Troy, New York? That's still there outside the Sage College. And let me show you a better picture of it. There it is. This is the seated figure. And um, Anne Scott has written about this a lot. Emma Willard apparently stated that a lady should never um, give a speech standing uh, she could give a public speech, but she should be sitting, and then it was seen as conversation. So it's very nice that. <laughs> so it's very nice that this statue. She's forever going to be sitting uh, here by the institution that she um, founded.
But anyway, these are the alumni. I couldn't find Sage in this among all of these bonnets and everything, although I did look hard. Um, interesting to me that this woman constructs this community, this kind of community of educated women. It's a kind of a new idea. It's not class-based exactly. It's not exactly racially based, uh, though they're all white. Um, but it is, um, you know, the idea of the educated woman and what she is as a citizen. This was a, a powerful kind of um, rhetoric that came through in the reports of this organization. <clears throat> well, there we are. It's the bottom half of the Emma Willard School, 1906. Sage gave it, one of the first things she did was she gave her old school a million dollars, and it built a wonderful campus. It's like Duke or one of those wonderful campuses. So uh, it's interesting, though, that in the 1970s, this is the school where Carol Gilligan carried out her research on women's language. It's just a coincidence. OK, so now I'm moving rapidly into the time of Sage's spending and to the whole topic of philanthropy, which is really just the last third of the book. And here is the so-called summer home that Sage um, purchased. And it's on um, Sag Harbor at the eastern end of Long Island. And it's now a whaling museum. And um, anyway, she lived there for a while. And she tried to be Lady Bountiful. That is, she was kind of there all the time being benevolent to everybody. And they got very fed up with her. And there was a great row and a great quarrel um, that occurred. And she said, I'm never coming back. She left Sag Harbor and never came back. <coughs> Here was a text that was an interesting one. Um, again, a kind of genealogy. And this thing is all over the place. 1908. And I thought, why 1908? Oh, she's just got the money. She's just looking for things she wants to purchase. What could be more worth buying than a history of your family that is an, an ennobling history of your family? She, she employed two genealogists and sent them off to France and England. And surprisingly enough, they found very respectable ancestors for her. Um, on the French side, the Huguenots, because they had to be Protestant, and on the English side, kind of sturdy, upright people. And then uh, this book is published um, at, privately. She pays for it. It's a big book, um, pale green leather, and she bought about 50 copies, and she sent them to people all over the place. So you'll find this book in lots of libraries all over the place. And I wrote here on the side, genealogy marked the anxious search by turn of the century Americans for a venerable past. Philanthropy brought distinction to the undistinguished sages. So this was a kind of more a sign to me of, of anxiety and a need to be belong rather than any particular um, you know, connections. Here's another building she purchased. She was very keen on Long Island and Sag Harbor. She didn't purchase this one. This is Vassa. <laughs> this is, was the biggest building in North America. This is the main hall at Vassa. Um, Sage decided she would give to New York colleges, and this was a New York college. The correspondence from Vassar is, like all of the educational correspondence, very urgent, very, very urgent. When are they going to, when is she going to give money to this place? Wellesley, for example, wrote to her, the president of Wellesley, don't you think it's a good time to give now, now that our main building has burned down? <laughs> Um, she did give, um, when I was at a conference at Vassar some years ago, I was able to see uh, the dining hall that she gave, and it's got a, there's a portrait of her grandmother uh, in the dining hall. There's a fascinating correspondence with the president of Harvard, E. Lawrence Lowell, about naming a building. He said, let's call it Russell Hall. She said, no. Uh, no, she said, we'll call it Russell Hall. Her husband was dead by now. He said, we can't do that. We've got a Russell Hall already. Think of something else. He said, call it Margaret Olivia Hall, she wrote back, uh, can't do that. Um, I can't use my name. My feminine name did not seem suitable in this age of the new woman. In this, I think she used it, feminized age. It was a fascinating um, discussion. In the end, I don't know what they called it. I can't remember now, but um, you know, it was an interesting name. Naming is interesting, too. And I didn't realize that fundraising is interesting. How people name things is very interesting. The correspondence between fundraisers trying to get her money for Princeton is also fascinating, very Machiavellian kind of correspondence. Um, for example, now she's at her summer home is a time that she will see people quickly go there and see her now, uh, things like that. 
Um, she did give a wonderful quadrangle to Princeton. She gave enough money for three sides of it. And then when she went to visit, they said, well, she said, well, where's the rest of it? And they said, you didn't give the rest, you didn't give enough money. So uh, she gave the rest of it, which was like another 250,000. <clears> she wrote, quote, ancestral names attract me. And with Standish Hall in Cambridge and Holder Hall in Princeton, my ancestors could well hold up their heads. So here we have a need to be, um, to be recognized. From the foundation itself, she disappears from its history pretty dramatically. And so we have here the foundation here symbolized by John Glenn, kind of a withered old man, and Paul Kellogg, for those of you that know this period, period of reform, Paul Kellogg on his knees trying to get money for the survey journal. I'm going to skip that one. This is some buildings. OK, well, let me go to some of the late part of this book, which occurred with a, a, an unknown correspondence. I don't think it's a correspondence that's ever been used by any historian that I've seen. And it was between Eliza Kellis, who was one of those late blooming women. She had a, a Radcliffe MA at the age of 40 and ended up as the principal of the Emma Willard School. And it was with Tal, uh, E. Lillian Todd, who had become the secretary administrator in New York City. So you've got Kellis up in Troy, you've got Todd down there working with Sage in Fifth Avenue. And their correspondence is fascinating. Takes us inside Olivier Sage's home and the making of her philanthropy in the last six years of her life. It's a very interesting um, one. This is a rotten picture, but it's the only picture I know close up of um, Todd. <coughs> so you've seen this letter before. Um, I just want to emphasize the fact that people before have said, and fundraisers were told, you cannot see Mrs. Sage, it's too late. She now, she is, you know, it's sad, but you know how it is, people are old. You know, better not let you meet her. Uh, and so they're, in, they're suggesting that she's losing it, basically. Um, but if we see this letter written when she's 87, we can see this is pretty good. This is intentionality, not just largesse. This is, she's saying, I'm writing to say why I'm giving this money to this place. It's because of this, that, and the other. I won't read it all out to you. Um, I found out that she's actually very lucid, but she is being, in the last few years, there's all this money involved, OK? <laughs> and the people around her, her advisors, they're protecting her. They're trying to channel this money into their favorite causes, like DeForest wanted it to go to the Red Cross. He wanted it to go to um, New York City um, Forest Hills Gardens, which is a huge, of course, um, you know, housing you know, experimental housing suburb in New York. He had plans for her money. He didn't want her giving her money to the Methodist ladies organization to convert the Muslims, for example, which was one of her favorite ones. He didn't want it going to the New York Ladies Humane Society, which was another favorite one. He had his big organizations. He didn't want it even going to the New York Ladies Bible Auxiliary Association. It had to go to the American Bible Association, which was very corporate kind of organization. So you've got this fight going on. I've just glimpsed it in this correspondence of the struggle. There was also her brother, uh, who was also trying to get um, and he did very well. He got seven and a half million dollars, the brother, um, in her will. So he did extremely well. So I have been, oh, it's an hour. So um, here she is. Um, There's so many questions I don't, um, I can't answer. But I found it interesting trying to both imagine and reconstruct this life using these various sources. So I'd love to have your questions. Thank you. <laughs>